All right, so I just finished watching the Woodstock 99 documentary on Netflix called Trainwreck Woodstock 99. And well, I thought I really had to chime in and give my own opinions because you know what? I was actually there. I attended Woodstock 99 in Rome, New York back on July 23rd, 24th, and 25th, 1999. And uh, I got a few things around here. I got my Woodstock 99 VHS tape from the concert experience. But I also have my photo collection of all the lovely photos I took on a disposable camera back in 1999, since we didn't have digital. But uh, sure would have been nice to have had a smartphone in my pocket back at Woodstock 99, I tell you. The things I could have documented wouldn't have even come close to probably what you saw in half of those documentaries on HBO and Netflix and alike. But uh, I'm going to run a little slideshow presentation after this part of the video with a little bit of commentary showing you uh, my photos. It's a mixture of photos that I took and photos that a friend of mine that I was there with that they took. And after Woodstock, we just got double prints and exchanged copies of our photos. So more photos, more memories, but half of them are mine. Half of them are a friend of mine that I was there with that photos that they had taken. And uh, yeah, what a time it was. Woodstock 99 was the concert of a lifetime. I'm a 48 year old guy now. Back then I was 25 years old and it was a blast. Going from Canada all the way down to Rome, New York through the States. We rented a car, a friend of mine that I went with, he rented a car. A bunch of us piled into the car and off we went. And uh, you know, we might've had some extra party favors in our pockets along the way and we had to cross the border from Canada in the United States. And I remember getting to the border and my friend who was driving, he was all nervous and everything and that. And the border guard looks at him and says, nationality? And he looks at him and says, London. That's the city we're from. And he's like, oh no, 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 no. I, I'm, we're, we're Canadian. And the guy just kind of laughs a little bit and he's like, oh, okay. And what, what, what's your purpose for uh, visiting the United States today. Well, we're, we're all uh, going down to Woodstock 99. And like, this is a car full of like young 20 something year olds that look like they're ready to party. And uh, this guy just waved us right on through. No more questions asked. So you guys have a great time. Enjoy Woodstock. Right on through the border. No problems at all. Pretty good start to our adventure. Now, mind you, we set out on Thursday. So we showed up there by like Thursday afternoon and we were there for the concert that ran Friday, Saturday and Sunday. And we finally probably got all back in the car and out of there. We started loading up Sunday afternoon, but we didn't really have everything torn down and packed up and we weren't all in the car ready to go until about 4 a.m. Monday morning. So yeah, we were there for everything that went down. We didn't bail early. We didn't leave early Sunday morning before all the great events of Sunday that happened at Woodstock. But uh, no, we, we, we saw it all. As I was digging through stuff, trying to dig out some old t-shirts and stuff to you know share with you guys, I found this little paperback magazine here, New Woodstock 99. And uh, the stuff that was inside it, it's all pretty relevant images. If anybody remembers ICQ, <laughs> that was definitely 1999. There was a lot of ICQ images around Woodstock. There's a, a sponsor page of people that sponsored Ace Hardware. We'll talk about them some more later on in this story on uh, Sunday night, maybe something kind of happen with their transport trailers maybe but uh overall pretty fascinating that i still have this flimsy kind of comic book paper booklet from woodstock 99 
Let me just get to the middle of it here. This all talks about different acts, different bands that are going to be playing there. But right here in the middle is our iconic Woodstock 99 map layout of the grounds. And I tell you, a military air force base is not the place to hold a rock festival concert that's going to last three days and it's going to have people there for five days and hot tarmac with no shade wasn't the way to go about it but anyways i digest let me see what i have in here that i wanted to show you these are some photos from another festival that I went to, but in the back I keep all my ticket stubs from all the concerts that I've been to over the years. All the memories. And here we are right here. My Woodstock 99 page. I don't know how well you can see that. Oh, my ICQ thing fell down and behind there. Sorry about the glare. But yeah, there's my original Woodstock 99 concert ticket. There'll be some clearer pictures that'll be in my slideshow that'll stick in there as well. But look at that. That's my Woodstock 99 wristband right there. This puppy was on me for those five days. In all your documentary videos, you're gonna spot this light green wristband that everybody was wearing. I still have mine. Mine uh, even has a serial number on the end of it, which I'm surprised. The serial number is like 275,000 some odd hundred is the number that's listed on my band. So figure there had to have been at least 275,000 people that bought tickets for this thing if that's the wristband number I ended up with. Here's another one of my souvenir t-shirts if I can actually get it the right way around. Woodstock 30 years of peace and music and the back of the shirt had various bands from the lineup I haven't shown you the back of the shirt that I'm wearing I don't know how well you can see it but it also listed all the bands but yeah Woodstock 99 incredible experience was it hot it was damn hot it was so freaking hot like i swear to god people might have just like burst into flames or something because it was that hot out there it was incredibly hot no shade anywhere to be found honest to god with all the acts and all the stages with the main stage the other secondary stage the emerging artist stage that was in the hangar, I maybe saw 10, maybe 12 bands the entire weekend that I was there. Why, you may ask? Because of the heat. It was so hot. There was no shade anywhere. It was over like 100 degrees Fahrenheit every day, over you know mid-30s if you're talking Celsius. Scorching hot sun beating down out of a cloudless sky on the hot tarmac on runways. You got a picture. These two main stages were on opposite ends of a military runway that were two and a half miles apart. Two and a half miles apart. They would literally, to walk from the one stage to the other stage, 45 minutes to an hour probably, at least, to walk from one stage to the other stage. Now, where we were camping, if this was the main stage down at this end, we were camping right up in the camping area near the secondary stage. So that was a long trek every day from your tent all the way the, over the two miles, all the way down to where the main stage was. And then if you're tired, you need some of that shade, you need to rest and relax, two and a half miles all the way back the other way, down the tarmac, under the blazing sun, back to your scorching hot tent, just to get a little bit of shade. Now, me and my friends, we set up our tents kind of in a circle pattern, so they're all kind of facing each other. 
and we were lucky that we had well the tent that i took had like the awning canopy over the doorway i had an old style canvas tent with metal poles i'll get into that in a second too metal poles that was a bit of an issue but anyways one of them had a tarp with them so we were able to string a tarp over the roofs of these different tents and create an outdoor tarped shaded area amongst our tents thank the lord for that because i don't know what you know we just all would have got heat stroke and freaking died or something you know and we're all from canada none of us took medical insurance down to the states or anything in that so the last thing we want is to have medical medical problems or anything like that like these are going to be bills and huge expenses and i didn't want any of that so yeah i saw 10 to 12 acts the entire time i was there because I had to take care of me. It was crazy hot. $4 bottles of water. I was lucky enough to find drinkable water in one particular location. If you've watched the Netflix documentary, you'll see all these uh, like hand washing fountains and like showering stations or whatever that are set up around all these porta potties and that. From what I remember, they were clearly marked at least originally on the Friday they were clearly marked non-potable water, which means like you, you don't drink this water. This is purely for washing your hands and that's it. You, you don't drink that water. There were, I, I didn't hear any mention of this in any of the documentaries, but there were giant yellow, and I mean like giant industrial sized yellow plastic, big round bins of potable water which, you know, maybe they shouldn't use the word potable. I don't know if everybody understands what that means, but it means drinkable water. This is water that we tested that we know that you can drink. And I found a great big jug and cleaned it all out to the best of my abilities. And I filled it up with that free, hot jacuzzi-like water <laughs> because, you know, you gotta imagine this giant plastic bin. It's sitting on asphalt, on a runway, under the blazing sun all weekend the water inside this tank was jacuzzi temperature at least but it was drinkable and i had managed to sneak in with me planning a little bit ahead and not getting caught by we'll, we'll talk about security here in a second but i had uh kool-aid crystals with me thank the lord for kool-aid crystals never been so happy in all my life to have kool-aid crystals because, you know, I was able to mix that with this free water that I got. And, you know, of course, every now and again, I bought a nice cold bottle of uh, $4 pop or whatever, you know, might as well get yourself a nice drink instead of just water, if I've got the free other water to drink. But in, the, in this train wreck documentary I just watched, I saw all this stuff about trench mouth and people getting trench mouth from drinking the water at Woodstock 99. I did not get trench mouth. I found the free potable water, the drinkable water, and that's what I drank. And I don't know, it wasn't contaminated. I didn't have any problems. I didn't get any cold sores or lesions or anything like that in my mouth. But all the people, apparently, according to the Netflix documentary, all the people that drank the water out of the hand washing stations and the areas that you could kind of shower for free in that that were obviously right around the porta potties it was all contaminated and these people got trench mouth i never even heard of trench mouth this is like back from like you know world war one or world war two days when soldiers were getting this trench mouth disease when they're down in the trenches and stuff you know and they're stuck there for days on end and their water's getting all contaminated and never heard of it but like people had like cold sores that showed up by the second or third day their mouth was all blistered on the inside they couldn't eat they couldn't drink what a nightmare but woodstock woodstock 99 for me personally best freaking concert experience of my life what a way to end the 90s would i do it again damn straight i would and I'd, I'd, I'd make sure I was equally prepared as I was the last time. I wasn't totally prepared, but let, let, let's get back to security here for a second. On our way in, I, I had mentioned I had a canvas tent that had metal poles, like the much older style of tent, right? Before the nylon tents. And I show up 
I'm, I'm going in. I give the guy my ticket. Security guy looks at my ticket first. And, it, you know, I bought it here in Canada from Ticketmaster. Well, he doesn't recognize this particular printed version of a ticket and says, this isn't a real Woodstock ticket. This is fake. I'm like, no, no, no. Hold on here. I came from Canada. I bought this ticket up in Canada. If you can see the amount I paid on it, in U.S. dollars, a Woodstock ticket was $150, $150 U.S. Since I paid in Canadian funds, it clearly shows right on my ticket, I paid $243 for my Woodstock 99 ticket. All right, I convinced the guy it's a real ticket. He looked it all over, saw how much I paid for it. He's like, all right, all right, all right, all right. And I'm like, okay, now I, I've got metal tent poles. Is that going to be a problem? Oh, definitely that's going to be a problem. It's in the rules and everything. You've heard about how they confiscated just about practically everything on the, on upon entry to Woodstock. Any food, any water, and especially any contraband that they found. They took everything. Well, right away, this guy's like, no, you can't take that tent in with you. You got metal poles and that. You, you can't do that. I'm like, dude, I came all the way from Canada. I can't like just turn around and go and get another tent. Like, this is the tent that I have brought. This is the tent that I have. We've got to figure out something here. And I looked at him and I said, if I give you a couple of bucks, will it be okay? And he's like, well, what, what do you got? Sure, you know, what, what do you got? And I'm, you know, I only had like $140 US to last me the entire weekend that I was there, like the, the four or five days that I'm going to be down there. I didn't know how much prices were going to be in there. I didn't know that they were going to rip us off and gouge us like insane prices at Woodstock. But it turned out that I slid this guy a $5 bill and he did not search any of my belongings. He let me in with my tent. He let me in with all my bags, didn't search anything. He just took that little $5, stuffed it into his pocket, said, have a good day, sir, move along. And he was on to the next person. If you don't think these security guys made a freaking killing under the table by taking bribes from people, you are sadly mistaken. Because I easily bribed a guy with $5, a whole grand whopping five dollars but in the grand scheme of things you're thinking you're working this woodstock gate all day long and the sheer thousands if not hundreds of thousands of people that are coming through there if you shake each one of them down for five bucks this guy's loaded see he's loaded so you know security was lacking to say the least you know that's all it took was a measly five dollar bribe and security looked the other way no problem but Woodstock 99 overall, it was good, but the heat was incredibly bad. And the other thing that made it incredibly bad was the porta potties. The porta potties. Oh my God, where do I start about the porta potties? By Friday, probably late Friday afternoon, Friday evening, the very first official day of the, of the festival. I opened up the door to a porta potty. And you know where the seat level is? Well, the pile was about up to here. What are you supposed to do? I'm like, okay, well, that's just one out of hundreds of porta potties. So I continue to open up the doors on other porta potties and I continue to see the pile a foot above the seat inside the porta potty. I don't know what people were supposed to do. I don't know what people did. I imagine you just had to do whatever you had to do wherever you had to do it. But I'll tell you this, when it came to like bowel movements and stuff, I waited as long as I could possibly wait because nobody wanted to go and use one of these freaking, even if, 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 I think on Saturday I'd seen a guy that was like cleaning porta potties and stuff. An hour later, you'd open up the door a foot above the seat. Unbelievable, unbelievable. Now this might be a little TMI, but by Sunday, the last official day, I had to use the bathroom. 
and the bathrooms were just beyond destroyed at that point. Nothing was remotely usable. While wandering around this vast site, I was lucky enough to find a couple of five gallon pails. You can see where this is going. I found a couple of five gallon pails that were slid together, that were, you know, two pails slid together to make one pail. And I figured I'm taking that and I'm taking that back to my tent. And I don't even have to tell you any more about this story because you all know exactly what happened. And yep, I used a bucket. And when I was done, I took the one bucket out and put the other bucket on top. And I left that bucket sitting somewhere for somebody else to find because what else are you supposed to do at that point? But you know, you do what you have to do in these situations. Was it unbearable? Yeah. It was pretty unbearable. Was it incredibly fun and entertaining? Yeah, it was pretty fun and entertaining. Were there lots of naked women all over the place? Yes, there were definitely lots of naked women all over the place. Do I personally feel that this may have played a part in the crazy energy that developed over the weekend? Yeah, young guys, they tend to get you know, a little randy, a little riled up when you're walking around and all you see is boobies and boobies and more boobies and look, there's boobies there and boobies there and boobies everywhere. So, yeah, guys got a little bit worked up and frustrated and, you know, but as a mature guy, well, I was 25 at the time, but like, come on, there are lines that you draw but I, I also wasn't drinking alcohol the entire weekend I was there. I wasn't doing any psychedelic drugs the entire weekend that I was there. You know, you can tell by my long hair what I was probably partaking in. But I stayed away from all the chemical stuff and all the dehydrating stuff like the alcohol. Like this was not an environment to be drinking alcohol in like with the scorching sun and $4 bottles of water. Now, the cup of beer at the beer tent was four bucks as well. That might have been a bit of an issue because as a young, broke kind of person, what what do you want, a $4 bottle of water or a $4 cup of beer? Most of them took the cup of beer. I don't know. The mistakes that were made were definitely made, but you know, hindsight is 2020. I'm sure the promoters of Woodstock didn't fully plan on it, but they, you know, it was greed. They cut the corners, they cut the corners on sanitation, they cut the corners on security, and this is what happens. This is what happens. My generation, you know, Generation X, it was a heck of a way to end the 90s. Now security, they needed more security. The security that they had pretty much protected the stage areas, definitely the backstage areas, you know, their equipment, that's what security was focused on at Woodstock. When just generally wandering around the festival site, you didn't see security, hardly any, hardly any. On the first day, maybe you saw some Peace Patrol guys walking through the campgrounds and that, but they quickly disappeared into the, you know, I don't know where they went, but they disappeared. They took off their shirts and just joined the party, I think, for the most part. But yeah, the, the promoters needed way better security they needed way better hygiene. Like the, the porta bodies were, it was horrendous. They, they, they needed to control that. And the way that they ended up mistreating everybody all weekend long by gouging them with outrageous food vendor prices and outrageous drink prices, the heat, the lack of clean drinking water, it, you know, it all just bubbled up, of course, you know. And then you got, uh, you know, bands like Rage were almost like the anthem, you know, like everybody was there for corn and Limp Biscuit and stuff, of course. But Rage with, a, you know, F you, I won't do what you tell me. That was the defining attitude, especially come Sunday at Woodstock 99. I found overall things went pretty smooth on Friday and Saturday, with the exception, you know, of the heat and, you know, the porta potty situation and that. But things were relatively under control. Of course, it was Sunday. Sunday is when things, you know, got out of control. 
Sunday night, of course, everybody knows Red Hot Chili Peppers, last band to play. They interrupt their show right towards the end. The guy comes out. Now I can tell you from being there, I was right there watching the Peppers, had no idea that anything was going on way, way in the back behind me. Everybody's looking forward at the stage watching the show. The promoter guy that comes out, John Shearer or whatever, who I think is probably the biggest dick and probably mostly responsible for most of the stuff that went sideways at Woodstock 99, as much as he likes to deflect and say otherwise. He comes out on stage and he's like, hey, hey, everybody, I just need you to calm down. I don't know if you've noticed, but way in the back, one of our delayed towers is currently on fire. This is the worst thing the guy could have done because like I said, no, nobody knew what was going on way back there. Like way half a mile back nobody had a clue all he all he accomplished was pointing out the 250,000 people hey everybody turn around and look at the fire that's burning back there now we need you to just calm down and let our fire department come in and they're going to put out that fire and everything will be fine but honest to god all he did was point out the fact that there's a fire and like, of course, at a festival site all weekend, there were no campfires or anything like that allowed. So everybody was kind of like, cool, there's a fire. Red Hot Chili Peppers come back out on stage and decide they're gonna play their Jimi Hendrix tribute. What do they play? Fire by Jimi Hendrix. Honest to God, by the end of that song, I don't know how long it was, like three minutes or whatever it was, it went from one fire way in the back on this delay tower of speakers to like 50 fires all throughout the concert site area at the main stage. Within three minutes, thanks Red Hot Chili Peppers, smart call, play the song Fire when there's a fire. Fires were everywhere. So at this point, once everything's wrapped up, Chili Peppers are done, you can see fires all over the place. I'm like, I don't know what's going on here, but I am going back to my tent and making sure my stuff is safe because <laughs> I don't know what's going on. And so I'm slowly making my way back, you know, from the main stage to the tent area. And I'm seeing all, all the chaos going on, the fires, the bonfires, people dancing around the fires and stuff and jumping over the flames and doing all their crazy little antics and that. And... <clears throat> As I passed through the vendor village, I could see that, you know, they were all wrapped, like they'd closed their tarps on the front of their tents and that, like more or less closed their store. But you could see people going underneath and, you know, they're starting to loot stuff and steal stuff out from these vendor tents and that. And uh, I figured, you know, I'm not having any part of this. I'm a Canadian. I, I'm here from Canada. I don't want to go to jail in the United States. I don't want to go to the hospital in the United States. So I went right back to my tent into the camping area. And I figured I'm going to hang out here, pack up my stuff, you know, rest up a little bit. And, uh, you know, just make sure that my camping area is safe from all this craziness that's starting to occur. Well, it turns out right near where I was camping, the Ace Hardware tractor trailers full of merchandise weren't far away. I'm not even quite sure where they were. I never really saw them myself. But as I'm hanging out at my camp area, I'm seeing all these people running around back and forth, back and forth through the camping area. And I see that they're carrying like brand new tents and big bags of glow sticks and all these camping accessories. And I'm like, where's all this coming from? And one of the guys that's like camped right near me in that, He's like, oh yeah, these Ace Hardware trucks are over there and they just took a great big long pole that somebody had found, a big long metal like fence pole kind of thing and you know, stuck it in the lock on the back of the trailer and with a bunch of them pulling and bouncing on the pole, they just busted the locks off on the trailers and opened up the trailers and free for all, everything's suddenly free. And I knew all this was going on and I even thought to myself for a second, do I wanna take this heavy canvas tent with the heavy metal poles do I want to pack all of this up and take it all the way back with me or do I just want to grab one of these free brand new nylon tents in a box never been used and maybe I'll just take that home 
But it's like, no, I'm, I'm not going to do that. I'm, it's not my property. It's not my tent. So I just sat back and watched people run to these trailers, grab a bunch of stuff. They'd run back to their tents, drop a bunch of stuff off, run back to their trailers. I wasn't having any of it. But mind you, I was watching a pile of looted merchandise grow around my camping area where I was at. And uh, so as they would run away again, I'd go over and let's see what's in the pile. And there were bags of uh, glow sticks that were there. And that was the one thing that kind of caught my attention. I figured, you know what, I, I'm going to grab some of these glow sticks. But like, mind you, I, I didn't take them from the trailer. I looted the looters. <laughs> of, you know, I don't know if that's any better. Probably not. You know, kids out there, if you're watching this, don't steal. If it doesn't belong to you, don't take it. But yes, I, I took some glow sticks. But a matter of fact, I actually have one glow stick from Woodstock 99 left upstairs in my room. Will it work or not? I don't know. Maybe if you stick around to the end of this video, maybe I'll uh, go upstairs and get this last glow stick I have and give it a crack. See if it actually works. See if it glows. I don't know. Should I do that? Should I not do that? I don't know. After... What is this, 2022? So it's been 23 years. 23 year old glow stick. Might still work. Probably not. But it might. Who knows? But anyways, if you've watched this far into the video, I hope you'll stick around and watch my photos because I got some amazing photos from Woodstock 99 that are one of a kind. Of course, they, they look like many of the other photos that you've seen, but they're not. These are my photos and my friend's photos. So these are our personal collection of Woodstock 99 photos. Warning, there are some uh, bare female chests in some of these photographs. The vast majority of these women were aware that they were being photographed. We asked permission if we could photograph them, at least I did. You know, I'm not gonna take photos of any girl that, you know, without taking her permission first. So I got her permission, but I think for the sake of YouTube, I might have to censor some of these photos, but I'll do my best not to censor them that much. You know, just some little, little dots covering like certain areas, right? But uh, yeah, here they are. Check out my Woodstock 99 photo collection.
those of you that have stuck around here to the very end, I've got the glow stick. I went upstairs and dug this out. And I don't know if you can see on camera, but the little tube that's in there is still unbroken. This has been kept in the dark in a drawer for 23 years. Is it gonna light up if I bend it and crack it? This is a real genuine Woodstock 99 glow stick. Just imagine, just imagine if I put this up on eBay, what somebody might pay for it? $5, maybe 10, maybe a whole lot more. I doubt it. So just for you guys that stuck around to the very end of this video, Let's find out if this Woodstock 99 glow stick is still gonna glow. Yeah, let's dim the lights here a little bit. There we go, dim it down a bit. And, well, here goes nothing. Oh my God. Do you believe that? I honestly cannot believe that. I am in shock and disbelief right now. I cannot believe, I have a cat here that cannot believe it either. <laughs> here he is. <laughs> and can you believe that? 23 years later from Woodstock 99. As of the recording of this, this is September the 2nd, 2022. Looted glow stick from Woodstock 99. And the cat really wants to play with it. <laughs> un freaking believable I am, I can't believe that I cracked that and that actually lit up. I am stunned. Thanks for watching my video. The cat appreciates you watching the video as well. And for all of us that are at Woodstock 99, if you're watching this video, this is glowing this is glowing for you man unbelievable unbelievable what am I gonna do with it now well I guess I'll probably still hang on to it but it's not gonna work anymore after tonight crazy Woodstock 99 unbelievable that this is works thanks for watching guys Hit that subscribe button if you haven't already. I'm going to make more interesting videos all the time. If you like my personality, lots more to come. Thanks for watching.